meetings with distinguished speakers from around the world on important topics <clears throat> in pediatric surgery. We have very interesting audience from different parts of the world where some places it's morning, early morning, some other places it is night. And in our place, Egypt and uh, Cape Town, uh, Africa, uh, South Africa, it is midday. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Todd Ponsky, uh, the speaker of today, uh, who is uh, the professor of surgery and director of clinical growth and transformation Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He is actually a shining star in the sky of pediatric surgery, not only in knowledge and skills, but in another very important aspect, which is uh, online education, technology, and innovation. One thing is beautiful about Todd is that you never uh, see the same lecture twice. Every time he's adding something new, something more, something uh, uh, innovating or stimulating. So we expect an unusual uh, presentation. To moderate this session, we have two distinguished uh, pediatric surgeons, Alp Numanoglu, who is uh, president-elect of the WUFAPS and he is a Charles F.M. Saint professor and the head division of pediatric surgery, Red Cross War Memorial Hospital in Cape Town. And from the other side of the world, from Japan, we have another distinguished pediatric surgeon, Go Miyano, from Gentendo University School of Medicine. He's the Secretary General of the Pacific Association of Pediatric Surgeons, and he is a Secretary General of the IPEG in Japan. So uh, again, I would like to welcome you all, and uh, Todd, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I love this group. This is going to be fun. Uh, it's very international, and I see that there's a few people on here <laughs> that were on the lecture a few days ago to Siberia. So I apologize because it's the same question. So you cannot uh, answer any of these and tell anybody the answers, although there's a few new ones. Uh, let's see here. So here's my talk. Can you guys see okay? All right, good. So uh, just to clarify, all of these uh, topics that I'm going to show, these videos that I'm going to show, they're all in the app. It's a free app called Stay Current. It's in the uh, Google Play or the Apple Store. It's a free pediatric surgery app where all of these will be housed and it's podcasts and videos and all that kind of stuff. So let's get started with the first question. So if a, let's say a 16 year old comes in looking okay, a little bit of chest pain and you get a chest x-ray and they have a, a pretty um, moderate sized pneumothorax. Uh, so how do you manage it at your hospital when someone comes in? Do you put a chest tube in? Do you observe them and see if it resolves uh, on the floor? Do you aspirate in the emergency room? Do you aspirate it out? Uh, or do you take them just straight to the operating room for a thoracoscopy? So I see that the numbers are changing all over the place. Alp, this is awesome. I love seeing the poles moving. Uh, let's see. So we got, it looks like chest tube is creeping up to the top, although now it's observation, it's all over the place. The only thing that nobody answered, D, is thoracoscopy. That surprises me, uh, but, but this is good. So let's see which article came out this year uh, to, to sort of guide us. And all of these are gonna be new articles that sort of change the way we practice. And I am anticipating that we're gonna see a surprise on all of these questions. So here we go. Here's an article you should know about. The Journal of Pediatric Surgery published a study from the Midwest Pediatric Surgery Consortium looking at the optimal management of spontaneous pneumothorax. In this prospective trial, patients were initially treated with simple air aspiration from the pleural space of the pigtail catheter in the emergency department, followed by six hours of observation. If the pneumothorax did not recur, they were sent home. And if it recurred, they were admitted to the hospital. They found that 83% of those who failed the aspiration eventually required a VATS procedure. The recurrence rate of those who were sent home was 44%, with no episodes of tension pneumothorax. The authors recommend performing this aspiration protocol, and all patients that fail should go straight to the operating room since the need for the OR is so high in these patients. All right, so let me try to summarize that. This is a confusing conclusion here. This was a very robust study. You saw how many institutions participated in this prospective trial. 
They aspirated and waited for six hours to see what happened. And if they didn't drop, that means the hole was probably closed. So they just sent them home. And if the if they did the aspiration, waited six hours, and the lung fell down again, they admitted them, observed, and then if they um, if they if they had a chest tube, and if they didn't do well, they went to the operating room. Eighty three percent of those that got a chest tube ended up going to the operating room. So what does this mean? Well, right now it just tells us that we need to do the next prospective trial of if you aspirate, if you do the aspiration, and they have a pneumothorax still after the aspiration, you just go straight to the operating room. So the idea is putting a chest tube is probably never the answer. Either send them home or go to the operating room. But putting in a chest tube is probably an unnecessary step that we're gonna eventually eliminate. And it's funny because that was one of the most popular answers. All right, next one. After a pyloromyotomy, which feeding protocol, um, let's see, which feeding leads to the fastest time to full feeds? I got to move all these uh, poles and stuff so I can read. So start with clear liquid, then half strength feeds, then full strength feeds. So it's sort of a sequential thing. B, start with one ounce of feeds, then two ounces of feeds, then three ounces of feeds, and then ad lib. So you don't have any clears, just straight to feeds. And then the third, just let them take what they want. So what is it that people do here the most? It looks like it's... Uh, Switching between A and C, so about half the, uh, it's, a, it's all over the place, but you can see we have it all over the place. And so let's see what article came out this year. Here is an article you should know about. It was published in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery in 2016. Dr. Markle and his team at the Riley Hospital for Children performed a randomized controlled trial to assess feeding after surgery for pyloric stenosis. They compared a relaxed feeding strategy that was mostly ad-lib to their standard incremental feeding protocol of scheduled Pedialyte, half, and full-strength feeds. They found that a relaxed feeding strategy decreased the time to goal feeds and overall length of stay without significant differences in post-operative vomiting or readmissions. Those with serum chloride less than 100 on admission took significantly longer to reach their feeding goal. Check out the link below. So, you know, I've seen studies both directions, but a lot of the preponderance of the literature in the last maybe five years is definitely leading towards ad lib feeding. There's been some papers that have shown, yes, the patients may start feeds sooner, but the time is not much different and the parents get frustrated because they vomit more. So it's user's choice, <laughs> uh, but if you want to see, you know, data wise, which one ends up getting them to feeds faster, it's probably ad lib. And it's certainly easier on the nursing schedule to just say, let the baby eat. Uh, so it looks like about 38% of people were doing that anyways. All right. Curious at all these different regions all over the world we have represented, what is the age for umbilical hernia repair that has the lowest recurrence? So what do you think? Is it one year, two years, three years, or four years? Which age has the lowest recurrence rate? Okay, so I'm going to move ahead because it looks like 70% of you are saying D, so there's not much debate. I, it's funny. Uh, you're, well, now it's changing again. So let's see. So uh, I, I wish I could. I'm curious. Um, what people do. I mean, is it one, two, three, or four? Let's see what age um, is the lowest recurrence. This is an article you should know about, published in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2019. Umbilical hernia repair is one of the most common operations performed in children. Although it has a high chance of spontaneous resolution with almost zero complications while waiting, many children are having it repaired at an early age. The main results of this multi-state retrospective cohort study show that umbilical hernia repair before the age of four have double the recurrence rate and double the readmission rate. We should probably wait until at least the age of four to operate if you're not already doing so. So, you know, we had a debate in the different groups that I've been in. Some do earlier and earlier. Now, here's what people say. Here's where it gets controversial. Some say, I'll do it earlier if it's big. 
right? I'll wait till four if it's small, but if it's big, I'll do it at two or one because it's not going to close. And that's where it gets debated. There is a study that shows uh, back in the 1950s that the larger hernias do have a lower uh, closure rate spontaneously. So it could be justified to do it earlier, but I would just recommend wait till after four years of age. Uh, so that's um, a bit controversial. All right. So this one's totally wacky. Ready? Does the appendix affect ulcerative colitis? Yes. Let's say chance uh, A. Yes. It may help in improving ul ulcerative colitis. So you should always try to leave it in when possible. B. Yes, it does affect ulcerative colitis, but the opposite. It can actually worsen ulcerative colitis. So you should remove the appendix to help treat ulcerative colitis or see it has no effect on ulcerative colitis. So let's see what people say here. This one totally shocked me. I, I was, it was my partner, Justin Huntington at Akron Children's that told me about this paper and I reviewed it and called a bunch of colorectal surgeons and they said, oh yeah, we've known this forever. I, and I had no idea. Uh, so it looks like C, no, it has no effect is the preponderance of what people say. Uh, only 9% uh, said B, that it can worsen and 30% uh, said A. Okay, you ready for this one? Check this out. Hey, pediatric surgery. Here's an article you should probably know about. In the February 2019 issue of the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis, a prospective multicenter study found that removal of the appendix in patients with refractory ulcerative colitis resulted in sustained symptomatic improvement in 30% of patients. It was actually pathologic improvement in 50% of the patients and 17% had complete endoscopic remission. Check out the link below. How crazy is that? I mean, I had never heard of anything about it. This is an example where there are silos because the colorectal surgeons all knew about this. Uh, I don't know what the recommendation is. I don't, I'm not saying go take out everyone's appendix, uh, but maybe if they're doing poorly before keep switching them to new meds, uh, try taking out their appendix. Maybe you do that before a total colectomy. Uh, interesting controversy. All right. So next one, pylonidal cyst, just because this is so easy. Uh, not. I mean, I think nobody knows how best to deal with this. So how do you deal with pi uh, pyloridal cysts in your practice? Uh, let's see. Whoop, sorry. Observation alone, like any of these, there's crazy numbers. Uh, and Alp, I doubt that you put in like millions of different choices here for this one. But uh, you know, there's a million different ways to, to skin this cat. And, and I will tell you that historically, um, I did a, a big excision. Um, this was after they kept coming back. I would do a big excision and then uh, try to bring it together. And they frequently fall apart. The recurrence rate published out of Kansas City was about 30 to 40 percent. So although we pat ourselves in the back and say we're really great at uh, pylonidal disease, we're not. We're very bad at it. Um, because doing these big excisions just doesn't work. Uh, so this is an amazing new shift. Now, the video I'm going to show you was presented a, a few years ago. And the year after, almost everybody in the U.S. switched to this technique. Um, so I'm curious if it's like this uh, internationally. A concept presented by Dr. Aaron Lipscar on a new way to treat pylonidal disease. This is something we all struggle with. Our results are not very good. There have been many flaps described. And Dr. Lipscar actually talked about a procedure that was described by a Dr. Gips in Israel. And this procedure is very simple, minimally invasive, and has great results. The idea here is for a patient that has pyelonidal disease, you take them to the operating room and core out with a trephine or a punch biopsy. You core out the pits, and then you take a mosquito underneath the area, underneath the skin, and pull out all the granulation tissue, all the hair. And then you use the trephines as a curette, a, a smaller trephine than what the hole is, to go in through those holes and sort of curette out the cavity and pull out more, and then flush the cavity the cavity first with uh, with uh, saline and then with peroxide. Um, so the, the bleeding's usually minimal. All the punch openings are left unpacked and unsutured. Um, drains are not required. A dressing is placed. They're told to shower once a day, put a new dressing. There's no activity restrictions, except I tell them not to swim for two weeks. You know, injecting uh, the local, you know, take these little punch biopsies, 
They'll write in, I've done this where it's only been two holes. I've done this where there's been eight pits I excised. Um, it's really a very simple procedure. It really takes about three to five minutes. Then go into these cavities and pull out. I then take a trephine and go in. It's a smaller size than what the hole is and uh, just go pour it out. But it's a, you know, a cheap, quick procedure. Like I said, I'm the cleft lifts. I'm worried about padding and pressure. And with this, they're, they're lying down, they're awake. Okay. So I, I, I can see some of you raise your hand. If you've done this before, is this something that you have done? Um, looks like no. So um, I will tell you that I don't know anyone that I know personally that still does the flaps. Everyone I know at all the different hospitals I visited all do this Gips procedure now because the recurrence rate is the same. And in fact, uh, here's the data slide. Um, you can see pain is less, sick days away from school is less, and there's no difference in recurrence. So why would you do a big painful operation when this works exactly the same? There it really should be no reason to be doing the big flaps. And even if this fails, I would do it again before going back and doing this big excision that doesn't work. Okay. I can't wait to have the discussion. R write your comments down because I'm waiting for people to blast me and say, I'm crazy, please. I love that. So tell me why I'm crazy because I, I want some controversy. All right, next case. Now this one's totally, if you thought that was controversial, this one's totally controversial. And I'm guessing half of you will hate this concept, but I'm telling you, it makes all the sense in the world. So a two-year-old male with a history of reactive airway disease has been coughing for 12 hours. Okay, just coughing some expiratory wheezing. Mom says that the baby choked when eating a carrot and just started coughing. And it's all been going on since the baby was eating a carrot and hasn't stopped coughing since. So you're suspecting maybe a foreign body in the airway. What would you do next? The x-rays are normal. You get a chest x-ray, they're normal. What would you do next? The baby's not in extremis, but they're having uh, coughing and very highly suspicious of a uh, foreign body aspiration. So let's see. Okay. Brunk, 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 cat scan, observe, something else. I'm curious what the something else's would be. Uh, we got to get to that when we get into the q and A. I'm curious what the something else's would be. But we got almost a major majority saying bronchoscopy. Okay, now I'm going to tell you that was what I did until we read a paper that completely shifted what we do. And here's the gist. I'm going to show you the video, but I want to tell you this. I'm going to, the answer is CAT scan. Now you'd say, why would you get a CAT scan? Just take them for bronc. Because most kids, it's just a reactive airway. And the worst thing you could do with someone with a reactive airway is instrument their airway. It's a, it's a high risk case and it makes them worse. So if you could, if they're stable and you could delineate with 100% sensitivity, if they have an air foreign body or not, then you're eliminating the risk to those patients that did not need a bronchoscopy. So this is selectively deciding who goes for bronch. Let's watch the video. Dr. Mike Rubin, a radiologist at Akron Children's Hospital, presented some really new and interesting ideas in radiology. Number one, the idea of using a chest CT for suspected airway foreign bodies. Traditionally, any child that has a history which is suspected for airway form body, we take to the operating room for bronchoscopy. This unfortunately takes a lot of children who probably just have a respiratory virus going to the operating room, getting general anesthesia and getting a bronchoscopy, which probably will worsen their situation. And a lot of these are negative. So what he recommends is getting a CAT scan in these patients that are unclear. And that has an incredibly high, almost 100% sensitivity for airway foreign body. And then if they have a foreign body, whether it's radiolucent or not, you can still pick it up on a CAT scan. And if they have a foreign body, then you can do a bronchoscopy. This will eliminate a lot of unnecessary bronchoscopies. This is a child four days, four year old with two days of wheezing and may have choked on a peanut. Two the chest was normal, the cubes were normal, and then gets a foreign body. And you can see there in the bronchus intermedius, let's see, you so can see the, the peanut in, in the main stem or in the bronchus wow. intermedius. You can see the air trapping, which actually we commonly see. Mm -hmm. Here's the, the, the other view. Here's the, the, the foreign body sitting in there with the, with the air trapping. And then this is a 16-month-old who may have choked on a hot dog yesterday. Uh, the chest view, a little streakiness on the right side. 
on the decubitus views, uh, there was no volume loss. Or on the, on the decubitus view, the, you can see the right, there really isn't volume loss. It actually looks like the right lung, there might be some air trapping. Uh, he got a volumetric CT that was completely normal, uh, was diagnosed with bronchiolitis, went home the next day and, and hasn't been back since the CT. And so far, mm. you know, we've had uh, about 12 to 15 patients um, that we've done volumetric CT for foreign body. Uh, most of them are positive. We've had four or five negatives. Those haven't gone on to, to, to bronching. Um, so we've had 100% concordance. You know, we're, we'll get a false positive because there'll be some mucus plugging. There'll be some atelectasis. Um, Okay, so remember, we did this after reading an original uh, thing, so original paper. We then did our own. This is us reporting our own. And then um, uh, Dr. Alex Gibbons, who was my research fellow uh, last year, reported this at APSA uh, and published in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. We now had 133 patients. Uh, 84 were treated with bronchoscopy. And um, if the CAT scan showed a foreign body, the findings were confirmed on bronchoscopy 94% of the time. So it was correct 94% of the time when it did show something. But what about when it shows negative? How do you know we didn't miss it? Well, we called all those patients years later to see, and 61%, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, the In the patients, it was 98% reliable, um, about 100% sensitivity, um, and 98% and inter-observer reliability between the radiologists that when you call them, they said, yeah, they, they never had anything. None of the patients that we called afterwards ever had a form, ever had a problem. So it's just a whether or not they had a problem or not. And so, but I want to show a bronch alone, 61% had foreign body. So that means 40% of the time you're going to bronch and it's going to be negative. So um Let's go to the next case. 18 month old with intussusception, contrast enema performed, which re reached the cecum, but couldn't fully reduce. So you didn't get a flux of contrast into the small bowel. You just got it to the cecum. Uh, would you go to the OR for laparotomy? Would you go to the OR for laparoscopy? Or would you repeat the contrast enema in a few hours? All right, so it looks like an overwhelming majority would repeat the contrast enema. You are correct. So we'll quick, quickly go through this one because it sounds like you guys already know this one. He also talked about that patients that have an unsuccessful reduction of intussusception should get a repeat attempt. So as long as there's some movement, you, you know, we always try it. We'll always try a second attempt. Um, and again, if you get movement all the way to the ileocecal valve, then usually the second attempt, I found, yeah. are, 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 are possible. Okay. And these are multiple studies showing that second attempts work. All right. Next case. Uh, a 15-year-old male is injured in a motor vehicle crash. He has abdominal pain, his heart rate's 130, and his blood pressure is 90 over 60. You give him, first, you give him 20 cc's per kilo of saline. So one bolus of saline. He gets better, but then after several minutes, he starts getting a fast heart rate again. So now what? You've given one bolus of saline. What do you do now? Do you give another bolus of saline? Do you give a 10 cc per kilo bolus of blood? Do you get a CAT scan or do you go to the operating room? And it looks like, well, it's changing quite a bit. So, wow, we're 30, 30, 30 on the top three. Only uh, a small portion say go to the operating room, uh, but it looks like it's pretty evenly split between A and B, and then you got some um, A and C and then some Bs. So. It looks like um, a lot of people would give another bolus of saline. Now, here's the thing. That's how we were taught forever. From one here on my shelf, I have a book, ATLS, that says give two boluses of saline. And then if that doesn't work, you give blood. That's always been the teaching. Two boluses of saline, then blood. We're now changing. And here's uh, David Notrika to explain. Here are the key points that he made from this new revised algorithm based on this very large prospective study. Number one, we used to talk about giving 220 cc per kilo boluses of saline before you give blood. This protocol is suggesting earlier blood. Actually, patients that get 20 cc's per kilo and don't respond should probably at that point get a 10 cc to 20 cc per kilo bolus of blood. 
If they respond to the blood, then they should can go ahead and get a CAT scan or go to the pediatric intensive care unit. But if they drop and their hemoglobin is less than seven and they need further blood, which would ultimately total 40 cc's per kilo, they probably need to go to the operating room. The big magic number that David mentioned was, was four units of blood or 40 cc's per kilo. If a patient is transfused with 40 cc's per kilo of blood or four units of blood, that is probably an indication of failure in someone who can probably not be managed non-operatively and should go to the operating room. In patients that are unstable, um, it, if you don't respond to PAC cells and, and fluids, you need to go to the OR. And if you do respond, um, then you get the chance to go to the PICU and see if you'll stop bleeding in the PICU. That was probably the biggest takeaway point. You briefly. All right. So, uh, let's go to the next case. And that, and that is, by the way, let me explain that last video. There's something called atomic, A-T-O-M-A-C, which is like, 12 institutions that came together to do this prospective trial. And out of that came about 15 articles. Um, they radically changed the management of solid organ injury with this massive prospective trial. Number one, they saw to give blood early. Number two, we stopped using grade. Uh, no more grade one, two, three, four. They have an entire algorithm. And if you email me, I can send it to you. Um, but it's atomic. You can look it up, uh, uh, A-T-O-M-A-C. And there are all these papers that show a complete data-based, evidence-based new way of managing solid organ injuries. All right, next case. Uh, after placing an uncomplicated tunnel central line that works well and looks good on fluoroscopy, the resident says, would you like to order a postoperative chest x-ray? And you say, A, I order an x-ray in the recovery room for all central lines. Of course, get an x-ray. Or you say, I order an x-ray in the recovery room for all lines that are percutaneous, not cut downs. Or you say, I order a chest x-ray for only subclavian lines, but I don't get a chest x-ray for jugular lines. <clears throat> or I order chest x-rays if I have to make uh, multiple sticks or if the line placement didn't go perfect. So if it's a perfect line placement, no x-ray. Or you just say, no, I don't ever get chest x-rays unless they have symptoms. I don't get x-rays unless they have symptoms. So what is your choice here? Do we have a poll for that one or no? Yes, All right. So, one. Okay, here we go. So it looks like most people get an x-ray for all central lines. Almost half of you get an x-ray for all central lines. The next most common looks like only if you have to make multiple sticks and it didn't go perfect. But there's about 20% of you that say only if there's symptoms. That's a high number. So cool. All right, let's see the answer. This was a study by Sean St. Peter at Kansas City. This is Todd Ponsky from the Journal of Pediatric Surgery doing your two-minute review. Today, we're going to review an article entitled Chest Radiograph After Fluoroscopic Guided Line Placement, No Longer Necessary. The first author is Dr. Brian Dalton, and the senior author is Dr. Sean St. Peter. What they addressed here is, do we need to be doing routine chest x-rays after every line that we place? So what they did is they decided to have a new protocol where they try not to get chest x-rays routinely after lines. And then they went back retrospectively and looked at the results. They did 622 lines. 504 of those had no chest x-ray, they had no symptoms, and they had no adverse outcomes. 93 patients had no symptoms but still had a chest x-ray by surgeon preference, and none of them had any adverse outcomes. There were 25 patients that had symptoms and received a chest x-ray. Of those, four had a pneumothorax, but they were managed non-operatively and sent home the next day. There was one patient that was symptomatic and had a pleural effusion that did require a chest tube. So out of 622 patients, only one patient required a chest tube, and that was a patient who was symptomatic. So their conclusions are you do not routinely need to get a chest x-ray after every line placement. If they become symptomatic, get a chest x-ray, and if they need a chest tube, then you can place it. We hope you enjoyed this review. We'll see you next time. Okay. So 
Next one, we got a few, I think two left. One week status post tracheoesophageal fistula repair, there is a leak on esophagram. After one week of observation, there's still a leak. The patient is stable and the leak is draining out of the chest tube well. So now what do you do? So it's still going on a leak, kid's doing okay. Would you just continue observation? Would you explore surgically? Would you start IV glycopyrrolate or would you do something else? Dun, dun, dun. Almost all of you are saying continued observation. Uh, okay, you got about 15% of you that say start IV, IV glycopyrrolate, only 9% would go to the operating room. You know, by the way, you know who would go to the operating room? The group in Santiago, Chile, Miguel Gilfond and Jorge Godoy, they're writing a paper on early intervention for leaks. They go in and they put two stitches in and they've had great outcomes. It's an interesting idea, uh, but um, that's their article. It's an interesting paper. So let's see what we do now. The title of today's article is Role of Glycopyrrolate in Healing of Anastomotic Dehiscence After Primary Repair of Esophageal Atresia in a Low Resource Setting a randomized control study. The first author in this paper was Dr. Vagela. This was a prospective randomized control trial studying the effect of glycopyrrolate on patients that had leak after esophageal atresia repair. There were 297 patients over a 10 year period that underwent esophageal atresia repair. Of the 297, there were 42 leaks. That's about 14%. They then prospectively randomized the, the 42 patients into two groups, 21 each, the one group receiving glycopyrrolate and the other group receiving placebo, which was saline. The observer was blinded to which treatment group the patient was in. And Raouf, what were the results? So the main explored variables uh, were chest tube output, which was 124 ml in the treatment group compared to 370 ml in the placebo group. Second variable was the leak resolution, which was accomplished in 76% of the treatment group compared to 29% of the placebo group. And oral feeding, which was achieved in 71% of treatment group compared to only 14% of the placebo group. Okay, so uh, we started using glycopyrrolate. I will tell you a complaint we've had. The neonatologists are nervous about glycopyrrolate because it slows down the secretions and sometimes they get mucus plugs in their airway. Uh, so they're afraid of the theoretical possibility. It hasn't happened to us yet that I'm aware of. At least I can find out, but I haven't heard of it happening. But in theory, it could make your secretions thicker. Uh, so uh, you can have that conversation if the baby's still intubated with your NICU. The title of... Okay, this is the final question. And we, I guess we'll have a lot of time for questions because I finished about a half hour early. So what type of hat do you wear in the operating room? a disposable bouffant, a disposable hat, a skull cap, a cloth bouffant, or a cloth skull cap? It's all over the place. The one thing that people don't wear a lot of, are, but uh, now that's interesting. I wonder if it's gender specific, if it's males or females, it looks like there was more men on this than women on this call. And it might, that's uh, interesting why there's a few cloth bouffants. So let's watch the video. This is Todd Ponsky with the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. And today we're gonna address a hot topic of debate in the operating room, which is the safest headgear to wear in the operating room. Is it this? Is it this or is it this? Well, this question was just answered in a recent study called Hats Off, a study of different operating room headgear assessed by environmental quality indicators. The first author was Dr. Troy Markle and the senior author, Dr. Jennifer Wagner. This was done out of Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. This was a really cool study. What they did is they compared three types of hats to wear in the operating room and they did a head to head to head trial. They looked at cloth skull caps. They looked at disposable 
bouffant caps and they looked at disposable skull caps. The disposable bouffant caps had the highest shedding of all three of these caps. It was the most microbial and particle shedding on the field. The gist is that the cloth skull cap had the lowest permeability and the lowest porous material and had very low shedding compared to the disposable bouffant cap. <laughs> this is behind the scenes. <laughs> okay. Is it this? Uh, <laughs> the video is not working. Okay. So that's the end of the show. Um, so a lot of things that we talked about that are debating, by the way, that last one I showed you, that came about because it was mandated in many hospitals that we had to wear the disposable bouffant. And they didn't want us wearing our own personal uh, cloth caps in, in most US hospitals. So that study came out and totally showed an example of where a rule comes out with no basis behind it. And when you actually look at the data, uh, it didn't make any sense. So people went back to wearing their cloth caps. So does anyone disagree with anything I said? I'm hoping so. Thanks very much, uh, Todd. It's, it's Alp here. It's been uh, fascinating to listen to you and, uh, and, and then also uh, very, uh, um, you know, different answers coming through um, very, very from different parts of the world and it's, it's wonderful to see. Um, Go is gonna be co-chairing this uh, with me. So um, if I can ask our colleagues to type the questions or comments in the chat box and uh, we will be sharing them with, uh, with the audience. Um, I think the one thing we stopped discussing is, uh, um, you know, should we wear a mask or not in a theater thanks to COVID-19? I think that's, that, that question has been taken out of uh, um, the equation now, uh, but the caps are uh, still being discussed. Um, the, the, before we go to the questions, you know, it always is uh, interesting for me to see how um, sort of shared the answers are. Um, you know, in most of the questions when you asked, uh, I think there were one or two that came out as, you know, one answer dominated it. Uh, but most of them, uh, you know, you have uh, 30%, 40%, 20%. And um, so these are all the um, issues that we've all read about, we've all been practicing and so on, but yet uh, the practice changes. And perhaps the uh, the impact of uh, you know working in different areas, um, although the disease uh, might be the same, you know, take interception uh, is is one example. Um, the way that they present, the, the length of the history, the, the methods available to us in treating the uh, child with the interception are all different, of course, and that's maybe one of the other reasons why it's uh, impacting on the. Uh, on the answers that, that we're seeing here. Um, and again, if, if there's any questions or co from the colleagues, if there's any comments from the colleagues, you're more than welcome to type it in the chat box and uh, Go and I will uh, try to um, share them and, uh, and, and put them to the thought going forward. And it's really been a fascinating discussion. Thanks, thanks very much again. I'm seeing some comments saying, I saw that getting a CAT scan is too much for a foreign body. That's, I want to comment on that. that. I'll just give you my opinion. That's the obvious point. The obvious question is, is a CAT scan too much, right? That's it's like, whoa, I mean, why would you get a CAT scan? Let's just do a brunk. I think the first time you go in and have a, a bad situation in the operating room because you're putting a brunk and the child starts getting into respiratory difficulties and it's a quite scary situation, and you find out the child never even had a foreign body is, is the reason this was developed. Because sometimes that can be a high risk situation if they have a severe reactive airway. I mean, you remember anesthesiologists don't even want us to operate on someone who had a, an upper respiratory infection six weeks ago because they can get into trouble. So now you're taking someone who has an active reactive airway and you're putting a bronchoscope down it. That's where this came from. Whether or not that's the right answer is up to debate and everyone can choose their own. We do that now because we want to limit the risk of, of doing bronch on patients. There was one other um, comment about the uh, use of blood and uh, I think it's coming through again as the ATLS yeah. protocols have been changed to what you have uh, uh, yep. recommended in, in, your, uh, in your presentation. So, very, this is where a clash happens now. So APSA and Atomic, Atomic is the study group, APSA agrees with that now with a almost, almost identically. ATLS has not quite caught up yet to, to this stuff. Now this is for pediatric, uh, but that's where 
um, you know, there, I think that the, the, probably within this year, ATLS will put out a new edition that will reflect the atomic data because no one else has come close to any data like that. It's all been, we've used Steve Stilianos's protocols that were never based on data really. Um, finally, we have data. So it's, it's your choice for now. Do you want to um, follow ATLS or Atomic? It's, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just that we've mostly switched uh, to most of the trauma centers in, in the United States have switched because of this study that we now give earlier blood. It's not wrong to wait until ATLS catches up. Uh, and that is, it may have already even happened. If not, it will happen within the year or so. Um, Go, you may need to uh, switch your microphone on if you want to uh, comment as well. And uh, perhaps uh, while we're waiting for the questions to come through, one, one other thing I can ask you, um, Todd. So we, we're living in this information age, but there is obviously avalanche of information coming through. Um, and, and you beautifully summarized it all to us. And I've also had the opportunity to uh, attend to one of your talks uh, um, last year when we still had the Congresses going on. Um, so these two minute videos, are they available somewhere else? Can we guide colleagues to a site or a, um, you mentioned in the beginning of the talk as well, to, to see what is available as, uh, as a recently uh, developed uh, recommendation for any topic? So Alp, I love you because you always know exactly what I want to answer. So that is, you fed me my favorite question. So um, there is a big problem now with exponential growth of publications. So publications are growing at an exponential rate. They're doubling every, actually they say every 73 days we're doubling the number of publications because there's so many open access journals now. It's just, there's too much. And so it's impossible to know what to pay attention to. It used to be you read one journal. Now, now there's just no way. So we've been working on three ways to solve that problem. And it's gonna take a long time. Number one is we're applying artificial intelligence. So we cre created a machine learning algorithm and have been comparing it to editorial boards that have so far only one year's worth of 85% accuracy that the machine can predict a good paper 85% of the time. The machine learning, the data scientists say that when we now do three years worth of content, we'll get to 95% accuracy. My guess is using an AI algorithm, we'll, we'll look at the power of the study, the, a bunch of different factors and will help us determine a, a, a filter that will put the good stuff at the top. The second thing is crowdsourcing. So if people like an article a lot, it could rise to the top. There's a journal called the Social Science Research Network that uses crowdsourcing to determine, to help people pay attention to what to, to read. That's what YouTube does. The argument there is that it's not vetting the quality of the study, it's more what's sexy and popular. Uh, the third is a platform or uh, using a better system of disseminating the, the good stuff. And that's what we're focusing on also, which is what you just saw. How do we disseminate this? Uh, number one, through social media, through the JPS Facebook page, uh, and then through the Stay Current app. They're both free, um, though we put one out a week, uh, a new article. And right now we're choosing them, but we're trying to invite the world to help us figure out what are the best articles and then to create these videos. So we've created something called the IDEA team, the International Digital Education Alliance. Anyone's invited, please come. And we meet regularly and we go over, I see a few couple people in here, Hanan, that are part of that. Uh, and we talk and we invite, a lot of those videos you saw were from people from the IDEA team that sent in uh, their videos. So uh, if that helps, contact me, tponsky at gmail, if you want to be part of the IDEA team and help us figure out this problem. Thank you very much. Um, yep. Go, could you, could you see anything? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Todd, for your excellent talk. You know, we always, we always enjoyed your, you know, entertaining, you know, <laughs> It's always so. Uh, my question is same. Like uh, you check, I thought you checked uh, uh, all the you know journals, but maybe uh, general pediatric surgery and the pediatric surgical international. But what about uh, you know local in uh, like 
genre in the uh, Asia, genre in the Africa, you know, this is, uh, because this is a war of apps, right? So, yeah. you know, it, it's sometimes difficult to choose the uh, uh, manuscripts from you know, all over the world. So could you make the comments? Yes, something? and that's why the great comment go, and that's why we created the idea team is that I was choosing all the articles from the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, number one, because I'm a part of the editorial team. And so I was realizing that's not fair. I'm choosing only articles that are in my out of my country. So we created the idea team where people could send what was a relevant article from their region. And if I had time, I could show you a lot of these were very region specific. Um, but I think what we need to do is it shouldn't matter what journal it comes from if we determine the criteria that makes something an important article, uh, we need to meet together to say, if it comes from a journal here or there, if it meets these criteria, all are equal. And we need to figure that out and maybe disseminate things regionally. regionally. So in areas that have high tuberculosis, a tuberculosis article is much more important than it is in the US where that's very low. I don't know, but we're trying to to figure that out. And uh, I would really encourage people to send me an article that was critical in their journal and make a video review about it. Well, how often you can find those, you know, interesting, controversial articles? Well, um, unfortunately, we see them a lot. I mean, it's the question is, if you go through right now, it's me uh, and I, I see Amadeo raised his hand and I'll, I get, to, but right now it's me and my team picking articles and we have like 20 and we'll say, well, which would you say are the top? And it's like, it's, it's terrible. It's up to us saying, we think these are good. And so, uh, and we usually take ones that are more treatment focused, not basic science, which is also bad. There's um, uh, people have sent me videos of basic science articles because they saw I was neglecting that. I wasn't putting basic science articles out there. Um, and then we have Jose Campos from Chile who said, you know, the other thing you're paying, you're neglecting are the adult journals because some of those are very relevant for pediatric surgery. So he goes into the non-pediatric surgery journals like Cell, Science, Nature, other ones, and he finds ones that aren't in the pediatric surgical literature. Uh, it's a problem, Go, and, and we haven't solved it. I think you can uh, please, please, please give me talk in Asia as well in future in near future. Please give uh, talk. Definitely, would love to. Physical or uh, or virtual? <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> Todd, you were talking about uh, pediatric and adult, and they were asking whether whether adult journals have been con in included or not. And there's a question about the central line study. And the colleague is asking whether uh, it's an adult uh, or a pediatric uh, study. Um, so once we hear the answer from you, uh, we'll ask Amadeo um, to, uh, to comment uh, through his microphone. Thanks. Yeah, that was only pediatric patients. That was done at Mercy Children's Hospital in Kansas City by Sean St. Peter. Only pe peds. Thank you very much. So uh, Amadeo Zanotti is uh, a WOFAP's uh, regional area representative from uh, Latin America, and we're delighted to have you online, Amadeo, um, of uh, giving me the microphone right. So it's uh, your microphone is on now. We look forward to hear from you. Hey, <clears throat> good morning. Little, little freeze. Yeah. I also couldn't hear. Yeah. We could come back, I okay. guess. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll come back to uh, Amadeo. We can't hear him at the moment. Um, yeah, there was a question I saw about um, massive transfusion protocol. I'm curious if everyone has that in their hospitals now. Um, you know, the, the general rule for us is if you ever think you're going to give, need to give blood, we activate the massive transfusion protocol. There actually are much more specific criteria. And if I had my trauma director, he could give you the specifics, but that's my rule is if I, I see someone coming in and I'm giving blood, I usually activate the massive transfusion protocol because you wanna give more than just PAC cells. You wanna give whole blood. You wanna give PAC cells and platelets and FFP. Um, so uh, the, 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 the chest tube thing is, is another thing I'll, I just want to bring up. I'm curious what if anyone disagreed with that. 
um, aspiration uh, protocol. So, you know, that doesn't really give us a treatment conclusion, just the fact that if anyone needed a chest tube, 83% ended up getting a VATS. So you could make an argument to just take all these patients for VATS. Keep in mind that 40% of them uh, might have never needed a chest tube or a VATS, that by the time they came to the hospital, it had already sealed. So maybe you determine who's that 40%, uh, send them home, and then the rest all go to the operating room. But it's hard to know how to interpret that. I told you about that uh, pneumotorax, that's spontaneous pneumotorax. Am I, am I right? Spontaneous. I remember. So we, there may be um, obviously other, um, other indications, but uh, this, this relates to the spontaneous pneumotorax. Yes, Alp. And the important point about that is, and this is the study we're going to do next. Um, in this small series, uh, no patients had any problem who went home. No one got sick. I am proposing, I'm curious if anyone here has ever seen a patient get into extremis from a spontaneous pneumothorax? Not a traumatic one, but a spontaneous pneumothorax. No one I know has ever seen a patient become critically ill uh, or get a tension you know, situation from a spontaneous. That's why it's probably safe to send them home because they might just come back again, but it's very unusual or almost never happens that they would get sick. Well, do, you, do you have similar experience with spontaneous pneumoperitoneum with patient lacks abdomen, no clinical signs, open bowel? Would you wait similarly or operate? It's a great question. Um, so I have seen that um, a couple of times only uh, where we saw air in a completely benign abdomen. Um, and we observed and both of, both of those times, and then we produced articles from the adult literature, a lot of COPD patients will get spontaneous benign pneumoperitoneum, but that's quite unusual. And it's somehow air tracking down, uh, just like kids get mediastinal air. Uh, if they have no other signs or symptoms, I, I would continue to observe them. But if they have even anything, I would operate <laughs> the slightest bit. Yeah, I agree. Amadeo, are you back? You can speak yes. now. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, I'm sorry. I had uh, a bad uh, connection level and I had to switch to the iPhone. Um, well, but um, I wanted to comment on, on, the, on the need of the x-ray after putting an, uh, an IV line. Um, I if, you, if it is done under fluoroscopy, I would never ask uh, another um, x-ray, uh, a chest x-ray to check, to, <clears throat> sorry, just to check on the, on the IV line. Uh, Sometimes it's not possible to do on the fluoroscopy, at least in our places. Uh, and then we ask for uh, an x-ray after putting an IV line, even if it is working well, just to check on the point of the catheter, the tip of the catheter. Uh, um, but if it, if it is done under fluoroscopy, we never uh, um, uh, we request another chest x-ray. Uh, that's the, what the, it was the comment that I wanted to make and the point that it, it should always, uh, it should always uh, be tried to do under fluoroscopy to do uh, to put an IV line if it is possible, if it is available. And that is the point I think it is important that every time you need a, to do a tunnel IV line, a central, uh, central line, uh, do it under fluoroscopy. Uh, the, that was the comment that I wanted to make. Thank you so much, Amadeo. Uh, um, uh, my only comment is that uh, I, I agree we use fluoroscopy and actually I use ultrasound as well to place my jugular lines now. That's after a study out of Kansas City showed a, uh, a, de a decreased complications by using both. Um, I, I curious, Amadeo, what the benefit of fluoroscopy, uh, do you think it would help show you that you wouldn't get a pneumothorax or it would show you if you... Um, the placement of the line. So you knew like the x-ray has a few purposes. One is it could confirm how well the line was placed. 
Two, it can show a pneumothorax. And three, it can show bleeding, like a pleural effusion. Of those three complications, I'm assuming the placement of the line would be ruled out if you used fluoroscopy, but the pneumothorax yeah. and the blood might not be, correct? Or all three? No. Okay, that's that's correct. Then I agree with you. Uh, the placement of the of the catheter of the of the line, even the guide, you can see uh, with the fluoroscopy where it is, and uh, just uh, slide the catheter to the uh, to the uh, central line, central vein. Uh, but if you don't have to to um, try every uh, many times uh, if you do at once uh, in in one puncture you slide the catheter in um, it is most likely that would not won't have any um, any adverse event uh, and if you do under fluoroscopy i wouldn't ask if the patient have some symptoms then i would uh, check on the with the next ray uh, but if it is there is uh, no sim symptoms, um, I would be sure that uh, the central line went to okay. Uh, if we saw it on the on the on the fluoroscopy. Great. You agree with the study then? Yeah. Yes, certainly. Can I can I ask? Can I add something? I think the justification behind asking for chest X-ray later on is that the pneumothorax may not be evident and the hemothorax immediately, and it is gonna take half an hour to one hour. So that, that was, I think, the justification behind that. Thank you. I think we have two studies. We had the spontaneous pneumothorax study and the central line study. <laughs> Both have this general theme that maybe these micro pneumothoraces are not as scary as we thought that you have to always do certain treatments that um, these these children usually might have mild symptoms and you can follow their symptoms rather than routinely getting an x-ray or in the case of the spontaneous pneumothorax always putting in a chest tube you may not always need to it seems though that there is always a, a point of over treatment due to worry of the surgeon they are doing things that probably don't need you do operation when you don't need it. You do intercostal tube when you, 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 you give more antibiotics when you probably don't need it. So probably we need to hold our horses according to evidence and see what we exactly need to do. Agreed. Just around the uh, same uh, issue maybe, but there's a, a query that came through the chat box regarding the use of ultrasound um, instead of the chest X-ray. Again, I think it's different than the chest X-ray. The ultrasound certainly has been shown by the St. Peter group to decrease um, hematoma, to decrease the chance of, um, I mean, I think that was, bleeding was the most common of the multiple sticks. You just get more accurate, but I don't know if it would show you if you got a pneumothorax. And so I think the point of the study was um, and, and Amadeo makes a great point. They did all of these under fluoroscopy. So I think they're assuming you did this under fluoroscopy. If you do it under fluoroscopy, there is a chance you got a pneumothorax, but most patients would show symptoms um, that you could then treat. Thank you. Uh, so do we need to much. operate at all on umbilical hernias? Of course, Munther writes that. So, uh, First of all, I'm curious, I don't operate anymore on epigastric hernias. Um, I used to, and now I give the parent the choice. Um, as far as umbilicals, uh, they're, uh, it's a very valid point. The argument why I fix them, and Munther, I don't fix them all. If the parent doesn't want, I say it's okay. The reason I fix them is it's so easy for us as, pedi as pediatric surgeons. As a baby, it's a few stitches. Once, if that persists into adulthood, it may end up requiring mesh and we can avoid that by repairing it in childhood. That's the only reason. I bet you most of these never need anything done. Todd, maybe there is an argument if it is a female uh, child and she's going to have pregnancy and delivery later on might during pregnancy get some complications or increase. So probably in females, 
I'm, I'm more sensitive to operating on them. Agree. Uh, one yeah. more question about pyeloneedle disease. Um, Todd, are you aware of the endoscopic uh, management of pyeloneedle disease? I thought that endoscopy will never go into these places, but it seems that <laughs> it can go everywhere. Endoscopy <laughs> for everything. Yeah. Uh, I tried it. Um, okay. So when I did this technique, I then put the endoscope in and I wasn't very good because all I saw was red. Um, you know, you can't insufflate. So I, I couldn't see very well. I was irrigating and I'm sure some people are better than I am and could see, but to me, it, it wasn't helpful. Uh, I also, when I first showed this, uh, Aiden from uh, Turkey said that he, he showed me his study where he used um, the phenol uh, uh, granules and put it inside as well. That's another interesting addition that you could do after is put some phenol in there. I found I, um, you know, it could burn the skin. Um, so we, we've had no problem with this. Probably if it didn't work the first time, I would add phenol. Uh, Ciro Esposito also from Italy has made a large series upon that. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, Mutar, I saw you raising your hand. Did you want to? Uh... Did you want to say something? Um, you can unmute the microphone and we can try to do it from here. One more time, maybe. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now, we, we started using the endoscopic uh, things in the pyelonidal sinus, and I'm, some of them are absolutely fine. I'm not sure whether um, Todd um, or anybody um, use cutary as well with that on two sides only. The other thing which I want to comment about the umbilical hernia, umbilical hernia is very common in Africa. And um, a lot of people don't operate, even females who are actually um, sort of becoming pregnant and things like that. So I, I'm, I'm just questioning that because there was a uh, move towards now prioritization of uh, surgical procedures in pediatrics and uh, because of the COVID and the question was risen do we need to do an umbilical hernia should be priority four or five um, so that's why I'm, I'm questioning about that the other thing which um, um, Todd mentioned about uh, the age of four years and I think because the um, development of the anterior abdominal wall carries on until the age of four years and hence some of the hernias will actually close by that age. Yes, uh, that's the point. And, and most are closed by the, the, what happens in the US is um, if you say you'll do it at three years, the parents will go to you because you'll do it sooner than the rest. So we all wanna try to have an agreement on four or five but then there's always some who will undercut you. Uh, and so we're trying to show that we should all be in agreement on, on an age and not undercut. Um, and so those at a university hospital don't, don't have that need, uh, but that's a controversy. I agree, I wait till four. Um, I do believe most are closed by three and a half or three years of age, but I, if the parents will wait till four, I'll do that. Regarding the cautery, yes, I've used cautery, but it's hard because by the time you, you have a, such a big cavity and it's under the skin because you just made the holes. So it's hard to get good cautery. Uh, that's the reason for the, the phenol maybe, but I don't know if that makes a difference. It really causes pain. Um, and then uh, what was the other thing you asked? Oh, not fixing umbilical. We talked, so I, I agree. I think most don't have a problem. The question is, it definitely is easier for us. So if you could avoid a few patients that needed mesh, that's the only argument. Thanks very much, uh, Todd. It's uh, been a fascinating hour and uh, really enjoyed it. I'm going to hand over to uh, um, Prof. Shihata now for the closure. And uh, thank you very much again from our side. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. I think if we, we could stay for hours in this uh, nice discussion, we enjoyed an outstanding and exceptional talk by uh, Todd, as usual, as expected. And as I promised, it was very interesting to everyone. We have very good interaction from the audience from different parts of the world. 
from Latin America to Japan to the Middle East and Europe. We have excellent uh, moderation by ALP, uh, the coming president of the UFAPS, and uh, by GO from Japan. And I would like the collaboration of everyone to invite you all to join the uh, visit the website of the UFAPS, www.ufaps.org, and become a member. One of the new features now is every pediatric surgeon can become a member of the UFAPS for very little money, but you will enjoy a lot of benefits and wait for us in the next upcoming web webinar. And uh, one last time, thank you all for an outstanding and perfect webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. You, ha you have a world round now to start, Todd, huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much.